Hello, everybody. Welcome once again. Um, thank you all for joining in. Uh, can I uh, request, hey, Divya, do you mind opening us, uh, opening with a word of prayer, please? Divya? Pardon? Do you mind starting us off with a prayer, please? Yeah, sure, sure. Thank you, Father. Thank you for this uh, beautiful day, uh, Father Lord, that you have given to each one of us, Father. Thank you, Lord, for uh, helping us, Father Lord, to join, Lord, come together, Lord, and uh, learn from your word, Father Lord, to uh, how you uh, intend us, uh, Lord, to praise you, to worship you, Lord, to glorify you, Father Lord. Uh, help us, Father, that uh, we uh, gain insights father lord that we may worship you in spirit and in truth father lord i pray father that whatever we are learning father lord uh, let it uh, let it be uh, father uh, rooted and grounded in our hearts father lord help us be able to apply we uh, ask the help of the holy spirit lord especially committing uh, pastor roshan into your loving hands father lord uh, you equip and empower him father lord uh, the all the words father lord may you give him father lord that uh, uh, Lord, let your grace be upon him, Father. I pray for each and every one joined, Father, and who are yet to join. I pray, uh, Lord, uh, that you help each one, Father, that we'll be edified, Lord, we'll be encouraged, Father, Lord, and we'll be a blessing, Father, wherever you have placed us. Uh, committing all these in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, thank you, Divya. Thank you. Uh, guys, I uh, hope everybody is doing well. Um, thank you for joining. Um, let's just continue from where we left off last week. Um, in your notes, page 21. That, that's where we ended. Um, OK, from chapter 5, page 21. Let's do a quick recap of uh, everything that we've covered uh, in chapter 5. OK, so uh, just f follow along with me, page 18. Uh, we'll do a quick recap, a uh, couple of two minutes recap. And, uh, OK, so uh, the four points uh, added to the definition of what is worship in our understanding of what is worship. Uh, the first one is worship is the recognition of who God is. And uh, we saw that in depth. And worship is the reverence for God. It is the communion with God. And worship is a response to an encounter with God. Um, on the side note, we uh, kind of studied a little bit uh, on the topic of encounter itself, right? Uh, what encounter means to us, uh, what it means to ha have an encounter with God. Uh, and we did that in the second session uh, last class. So I uh, sh I shared the PDF for the notes. I hope you were able to uh, download that for your reference, for future references, okay? Um, so we looked... Uh, so. The fourth point there is worship is our response to an encounter with God, okay? Um, and then and we move into page 20 where we see worship defies definition. And then we go into John chapter 4, verse 23 and 24, uh, where it talks about the Father is seeking worshipers, true worshipers who will worship him in spirit and in truth. Um, and spirit simply means... It is the Holy Spirit that empowers and enables us to worship him in the spirit, right? That's why it says, by the power of the Holy Spirit that abides in us. By the power of the Holy Spirit that abides in us, okay? Um, and there's a, an interesting Greek word that is mentioned in your notes called sebomai, uh, which means devout religious worship, having the right form, words, pious action, but no heart. Okay, so that is mentioned there because uh, after worshiping him in spirit, we are also commanded to worship him in truth, right? Because Father is not only just seeking worshipers, he's seeking true worshipers, okay? So if, if there are true worshipers, there are also, that means there are also false worshipers, okay? Uh, so just, just giving us that warning, that caution is like, hey, you can do all the rituals you want to do uh, and, you know, do all your daily activities that is involved with ministry and, and whatnot. But then if you're not, if your heart is not inclined 
uh, you know, then it's pointless, it's useless, okay? Um, so in truth, what does that mean? To, to worship him in truth. It simply means worshiping him according to the revealed word of God. Okay, uh, John 17, 17, it says, sanctify them by your truth because your word is truth. All right. Um, so we, we saw that and we, we're coming down to page 21. Right. Sorry, guys. Just put my phone on airplane mode. Okay. In conclusion, we see that uh, in truth, uh, we fail to worship when we don't have a revelation of what we are singing. Okay, that is ignorant worship versus intelligent worship. Uh, we need to involve our minds and our hearts. Okay, the more we exert our minds in worship, the more meaningful our worship is likely to be. Um, and John chapter 4, verse 22, before Jesus says in verse 23 and 24 of what the Father's desires is, that the Father is seeking worshippers. What, what he says before that is very interesting. He says, you Samaritans do not know. Or in other words, they just don't have the revelation, right? They do not know what you are worshipping. You worship something that you do not comprehend, you don't know. We know what we are worshipping. Jesus says, right? We worship what we have knowledge of and understand. So it's very important. And one of the, you know, it, uh, one of the points there for us to worship God in spirit and in truth is that we need to have a revelation, and that revelation comes with an encounter. Okay, that's why uh, we studied, uh, you know, the importance of an encounter with God. And one one encounter is all it takes for us to be changed and marked by His presence and His name. Right. Um, so that's where we paused. Uh, you know, that's where we ended and concluded the last session with. OK, uh, now let's continue in page 21 uh, with the section that says what happens when we worship God? OK, what happens when we worship God? Um, the first point there states that worship transforms or changes us okay can i say that again worship transforms or changes us okay what or whom we worship influences who we are and what we will become okay let me read that one more time okay. what or whom we worship influences who we are and what we will become Okay, um, having said that, can we go to Psalm 115, please? Just turn with me to Psalm 115. Okay, can I request uh, someone to read from verse 4 to 8, please? Their idols are silver and gold, the work of man's hand. They have mouths, but they cannot speak. They have eyes, but they cannot see. They have ears, but they cannot hear. They have noses, but they cannot smell. They have hands, but they cannot feel. They have feet, but they cannot walk. They cannot make a sound with their throat. Those who make them will become like them. Everyone who trusts in them. It's a very powerful verse, isn't it? That verse eight. Those who make them will become like them. Uh, uh, just some time ago, we did a series on um, idols in in for the youth uh, at APC. Um, now, in this day and age, uh, we Christians, or you know. When we say when we mention the word idols, the one of the first immediate thing that comes to our mind is statues, right? We we can see it everywhere uh, in India at least. Um, but all statues are idols, but not all idols are statues. Okay, all statues are idols, but not all idols are statues. 
Okay, the modern day idolatry it looks very different. We don't have a golden calf uh, or, you know, a wooden uh, or statues made up of, of wood and whatnot. Uh, a modern idolatry can look like career or money, uh, something or someone and whatnot, right? Um, and God warns us of idolatry and God's been warning Israel of idolatry, you know, even before they enter the promised land. Um, right. So uh, those who make them, I don't want to go too deep into idols because we maybe might be here for an entire session. OK, um, even later, if we have a time, I'd like to play a song, uh, you know, just it's just a beautiful song that's impacted my life. But anyways, so. It says here, those who make them will be like them. That means when you give all your affection, all your strength, your energy, your wisdom, and your ideas into in, that goes into making an idol, that goes into just thinking about this day and night, the Bible says you become like that. You become like something that's lifeless. Right? An idol or a statue by itself does not have any power by itself. But the moment when you bow down before that idol, you give that idol authority over your life. Right? Um, so that's that, that 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 is very scary and that is very important for us to remember. Okay, you become like the one you worship. Okay, um, and uh, I just want to share a very personal like, example. And uh, again, a couple of you might have already heard this, but um, there was a time in my life, uh, you know, for a solid nine months out of 12 months in a year, okay, out of the nine months out of 12 months in a year, all I thought or, or dreamt of or all my affection and everything was was pushed or focused towards a guitar. Yes, that's right. Okay, not this one. Okay, yeah, not not that one. Okay, uh, you, you know, like you, uh, the artists or musicians or any any field that you're in, you have something. Uh, I mean, we we tend to have something called that's my dream guitar, that's my dream car, that's my dream house, that's my dream job, that's my dream career, that's my dream paycheck, uh, et cetera, et cetera, isn't it? Yeah, you kind of relate to that, right? So similarly, I have, I have a dream guitar. Uh, and I'm not very proud about, you know, about what I'm sharing, but uh, just from my personal experience is for nine months, guys, I mean, like in that nine months, I learned everything I could about acoustic guitars, about the wood they use, why they use certain woods, and in and, and how many, how long does it take in building a guitar. So at that point in, in life, like if you wanted uh, an advice on which guitar to buy or, you know, whatnot, uh, uh, people would ask me and whatnot. So, okay. So I learned everything that there could be, uh, that there is to be learned about the guitar in the process of just thinking about this guitar, researching about this guitar, how many years I should save to buy that guitar, uh, you know, financial management and whatnot. So what I'm trying to say is a guitar is just so innocent, isn't it? It's just a beautiful instrument, right? It's, it, it is so harmless. And similarly like that, it's so many of, uh, uh, of our things or, or someone that, they are not they don't necessarily have to be bad but we but when we when we are consumed and obsessed by our love by our affection our devotion right every second of our life every fiber of your being is only thinking about that someone or something that's exactly what worship is right um so yeah i mean I, like i've been saying it's Almost three fourth of a year, I, I wasted a three fourth of a, of a year giving my worship to a thing that doesn't give me back anything. Right? It's, it's, when it's all by itself, it doesn't even make any noise, you know. Uh, but that was just a powerful, powerful. Uh, and again, God in His mercy reminded me, you know, He didn't give up on me, uh, you know, just like how. It was Aaron who built, who, who was a chief architect of building the golden calf. 
right? It was Aaron who built it. But then God chooses Aaron and his lineage to be the, a generation of high priests to serve before him. And that's how merciful he is. That's how beautiful our God is that in his great mercy, uh, he didn't just let me go. Uh, he came after me, uh, you know, and he reminded me of his love for me and of his grace and of his mercy. And then, you know, his, that refocus, you know, uh, it's like, hey, it's not about this thing. It's not about, um, you know, all these equipments per se, but it's about the one. It's about Jesus, right? Um, so worship changes us. You become like the one you worship, right? The notes say uh, in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 29, as mentioned in your notes, it simply says, our God is a consuming fire. And now when we think about, okay, when we worship the one who is consuming fire, we become like him. Right? Um, so let's, just, let's look at that scripture that's mentioned there in Exodus chapter 34, verse 27 to 30. Exodus chapter 34, it's mentioned in the notes at the bottom of page 21. Then it says, then the Lord said to Moses, okay, the Lord said to Moses, write these words, for according to the tenor of these words, I have made a covenant with you and with Israel. Okay, so now they are the people of the covenant. We should remember that, right? So, and then verse 28 says, so he was there with the Lord 40 days and 40 nights. Okay, 40 days, 40 nights. He neither ate bread nor drank water. And he wrote on the tablets of the words of the covenant, the Ten Commandments. Verse 29. Now it was so when Moses came down from Mount Sinai and the two tablets of the testimony were in Moses' hands. When he came down from the mountain, that Moses did not know that the skin of his face shone while he talked with him. What a beautiful sight, isn't it? He became like the one he was in the presence of. He did not know that the skin of his face shone while he talked with him. So when Aaron and all the children of Israel saw Moses, Behold, the skin of his face shone, and they were afraid to come near him. The glory of God's presence was radiating on, on the face of Moses. Right? And there's a psalm, um, I forget the psalm, but, uh, you know, I, I, mean, I just forget the reference, but if you know, you can just put it in the chat. It says, those who look on him were radiant. It's either Psalm 34 or Psalm 37. I'm sorry confused okay those who looked on him were radiant and that's exactly what was happening in Moses's life and his encounter with the Lord and for being there in his presence for 40 days and 40 nights his face was radiating right but the interesting part is uh, Moses is not the benchmark thanks John that's yeah Psalm 34 verse 5 you know it says, those who looked on him and their faces were radiant. And as I was saying, Moses was not the benchmark. Our benchmark is Jesus. Isn't it? So with that in mind, let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Uh, there are only two verses I mentioned, but then I want to read just a little bit more. Okay, so just go with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Okay, um, I want to read for us from verse 12. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 12 onwards. <clears throat> Therefore, since we have such a hope, we are very bold. Okay, um, I would encourage you to read the previous verses from verse 7 to 11. Okay, because uh, that's like the pretext to why Paul is saying, therefore. So every time you see therefore, you need to ask, why is it therefore? Okay. Um, so therefore, since we have such a hope, we are very bold. 
we are not like Moses who put on a veil over his face to keep the Israelites from gazing at it while the radiance was fading away. But their minds were made dull for to this day, the same veil remains when the old covenant is read. It has not been removed because only in Christ is it taken away. Verse 15, even to this day when Moses is read, a veil covers their hearts. But whenever anyone turns to the Lord, okay, there's another translation that says the moment someone turns to the Lord. Okay, Whenever anyone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now the, now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we, who with un unveiled faces, all reflect the Lord's glory. Okay, let me just read that line again. And we, that means you and I, okay, who with unveiled faces, all reflect the Lord's glory are being transformed into his likeness with ever increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. Amen. It says that we are being transformed into his likeness. All right, that's wonderful, isn't it? So, um, in other words, as we surrender to God in worship, there is a marked change in our thoughts, motives, speech, and action as we seek and behold the glory of the Lord. We become more Christ-like in our thinking, speaking, and behaving. Right? We are, we are changed, we are transformed into His likeness. And so that's what, that's what happens in worship. Worship transforms or changes us. Just being in the very presence of the Lord just rubs off on us. Amen. Great. Let's move to the second point. Next it says, in worship, we experience God's presence. Okay, we are in page 22. Point B. In worship, we experience God's presence. Okay, in worship, we become more aware of and experience his presence. And it is in worship, knowledge becomes experience. Okay. So the scriptures mentioned there is James chapter 4, verse 8. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Okay, so there's an invitation here. Okay, draw near to him, and he will draw near to you. Okay, uh, can you imagine uh, how beautiful it is when, um, when someone, like a being, an eternal being, comes closer and closer? He is not like any other being, like we've discussed so many times. Right? He is just not another individual person or or a thing but this is the lord of hosts we are talking about right? this is the everlasting father our prince of peace our alpha and the omega right? who's the beginning and the end from everlasting to everlasting you know he is god right and this god says, as we draw near to him, he draws near to us, right? And so a couple of things that happens, uh, you know, when he draws near to, near to us, you can make a note of it, is when God draws near, he speaks, he leads, he directs, he empowers, and he heals. Okay? I'll say that again. He speaks. He leads. He directs. He empowers. And he heals. 
right? And there's much more than that happens, I'm sure. But these are a few things that happens when he draws near to us and as we draw near to him. Okay, Deuteronomy chapter four, verse 29 says, but if from there you seek the Lord your God, you will find him if you seek him with all your heart and with all your soul. That is just another verse of saying, draw near to him means just seek him with all your heart. Uh, don't give up. Don't stop. Right? Um, this is a beautiful passage I'm reminded of. And again, Exodus chapter 33, uh, it says, Moses took his tent and pitched it outside the camp of Israel. If Moses took his tent and pitched it outside the camp of Israel. He went out. He disconnected. He, he, he put it out there to seek him, right? And the most beautiful thing that happens, actually, we can, talking about that, we can go to Exodus 33. Exodus 33, verse seven, okay? Exodus chapter 33, verse seven. It says, now Moses used to take a tent and pitch it outside the camp some distance away, calling it the tent of meeting. Anyone inquiring of the Lord would go to the tent of meeting outside the camp. And whenever Moses, listen to this guys, verse 8. And whenever, it means whenever, okay, I don't know what your Bible translation says, but Whenever Moses went out to the tent, all the people rose and stood at the entrance to their tents, watching Moses until he entered the tent. Some, verse 9, check this out. As Moses went into the tent, okay, as Moses is drawing near, the pillar of cloud would come down and stay at the entrance while the Lord spoke with Moses. Okay, beautiful, isn't it? It's just another version of uh, James chapter 4, verse 8. As Moses drew near, the Lord drew near. Right? Whenever Moses went into the tent of meeting, a pillar of cloud would come. And see what the verse 10 says there. When, whenever the people saw the pillar of cloud standing at the entrance of the tent. They all stood and worshipped each at the entrance of his tent. In verse 11, the Lord would speak to Moses face to face as a man speaks with his friend. You know, that verse messed me up for many, many years. What? How, how is that possible? I want that. Uh, uh, but man, I mean, for something like that to be recorded, and it's once again recorded in Numbers chapter 12, right? When God himself testifies of, of Moses that uh, to, to my prophets, I speak to them in dreams and visions, but not so with my servant Moses. With my servant, I speak face to face. You can read that in Numbers chapter 12. Uh, but that's the beauty of it, isn't it? Uh, is you take, as you draw near to him, you draw and he, he will draw near to us, right? Um, so I pray that uh, from this point that we would be encouraged to seek him, encouraged to just go after him and not be satisfied and not, be, and not to easily give up. It's like, oh, you know, it's, I, I tried, I tried, I tried. Um, but nothing's happening. Just continue to seek him until you find him, right? Um, and and like we saw, we read in Song of Songs, chapter three, in the last class, that I will search for the one my heart loves. I will not rest until I find the one my heart loves. And when I find, I will cling on to him. And we saw that in John chapter 20, where Mary Magdalene, she waited, she waited when John and Peter came, they saw the empty tomb and they went back. But Mary persisted until she found him. 
she continued to sort him. She stood outside the tomb crying. Right? So persistence, there's always a, God always responds to desperation. God always responds to hunger. Um, right? All right? Are you guys with me? Yeah? yeah I hope so. So that is the second point, right? In worship, we experience God's presence. Uh, that leads us to the third point. Worship empowers us to rule and reign. Okay, I'll say that again. Worship empowers us to rule and reign. Okay? Revelation chapter 1, verse 5 to 6. It says, And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler over the kings of the earth, to him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood, and has made us kings and priests to his God and Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Okay. If there's something that we need to know about the heart of God for us, humanity, is that we would serve before him as priests. We were made to worship. And that is the calling of a priest, is to continually serve before the Lord and minister unto him. That is worship. Right, and again, from you will see that from the beginning of the Bible, Genesis, all the way to Revelation, you will find another line that's repeated time and time again. It says, I will be your God, and you will be my people. I will be your God, you will be my people, or you will be my people, and I will be your God. And then, when you read Exodus chapter 19, right, when God brings Israelites out of Egypt. Um, actually, let's just, sorry guys, I mentioned a chapter and then I feel like we need to go there. <laughs> uh, apologies. Um, can we go to Exodus chapter 19, please? Okay, I hope you are all there. All right, I believe you are there. Okay, Exodus chapter 19. Verse 4, it says, You yourselves have seen what I did to Egypt. Right? You yourselves have seen what I did to Egypt and how I carried you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Right? I brought you to myself. I didn't bring you out for the sake of bringing you out. Okay, uh, You are now free, not for the sake of just being free. You are not set apart for the sake of being set apart. You are set apart to me. right? I brought you to myself. Okay, You are free in me. Right? That's what God is saying. I brought you to myself. Verse 5. Now, if you obey me fully and keep my covenant... Then out of all nations, you will be my treasured possession. Although the whole earth is mine. Verse 6. You will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words you are to speak to the Israelites. Okay, so you see that heart, uh, you see God's heart in verse 6. This is now very specifically in the Old Covenant, God is telling the Israelites, okay. You will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. So when God brought Israel out of Egypt, he wanted the entire nation of Israel to serve before him as priests. It was not just the Levites. Okay, but then when you read the whole chapter of 19 and 20, which... Um, I, I don't really want to do that, but then let's quickly go to the next chapter, verse chapter 20, and go to verse 18, okay? Chapter 20, verse 18. Exodus chapter 20, verse 18. I hope you're with me. It says, 
when the people saw the thunder and lightnings and heard the trumpet and saw the mountain in smoke, they trembled with fear. Okay? They stayed at a distance. Are you, are you seeing that? Okay? They are distancing themselves. They are not drawing near. Okay? They are not drawing near. They, they're staying at a distance. They said, at a distance, and said to Moses, speak to us yourself, Moses, and we will listen. They were lying that, you know, <laughs> they, because they did not listen to Moses. Right? Speak to us yourself and we will listen, but do not have God speak to us or we will die. Okay, now just to give these people a little credit, uh, you know, they've been in captivity uh, as, as slaves in Egypt for 400 years, right? Uh, 400 years, historians say, is an equivalent of 10 generations. Okay, 10 generations. That's a lot of people. You can lose a lot of theology <laughs> in 10 generations, right? So all these people who were exposed to, all they knew was that there, there is a God and they knew him as a God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And that one day a deliverer is going to come. That's all they knew. And for 400 years, generations after generations after generations, for 10 generations, they are only exposed to the idols of Egypt, to the cultures of Egypt, to the practices, the idol practice, worship practice of Egypt. They are only used to seeing fake gods. Gods in lowercase, small g. They, are, they were only used to seeing the, the way Egyptians worshipped. They were only used to seeing the way Egyptians ate and celebrated life. Okay? But they have never encountered someone this grand, this, this scary, this terrifying or whatnot. But then look at this. I mean, they just did not get God, the Lord's heart, isn't it? That in, like we just saw in Exodus chapter 19 is that he wanted the entire nation of Israel to be unto him a kingdom of priests, a, a holy nation. And then people distance saying, like, no, you know, Moses, you go speak with him. You come and speak with us and whatnot. And then later we know how the story goes. They build a golden calf. And when Moses says, uh, you know, everyone who is on the Lord's side, come this side. The Bible says only the Levites came. Okay, so this, the beginning of God using the tribe of uh, Levi kind of starts there. Okay, and then we all know, you know, it's until, you know, until Jesus came and died on the cross. It was that uh, the priests were all from the tribe of Levites. But in the New Covenant, as we just read in Revelation chapter 1, verse 5 and 6, because of the blood of Jesus and because of what Jesus has done, and through him, he has made us kings and priests. Amen. And if you see that it being repeated in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, it says, you are a chosen generation a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him. You see how that's connected to worship, right? Priesthood, a holy nation. We are holy. We are set apart. We are chosen by God unto himself. Why? That we may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness, who shed his blood, who redeemed us from darkness into his marvelous light. Amen? Um, worship empowers us to uh, rule and reign. Let's look at a couple more scriptures, okay? It's, it's powerful. Uh, let's read Matthew chapter 4, verse 8 and 10. Um, let's see. Okay, can someone read? Um, uh, I, okay, I'll put this in the chat and we, we can uh, read that too. Okay, sorry. Yeah. Is it Matthew chapter 4, 8 to 10? Yes, Devya, please. Yeah. 
Yeah. Again, the devil took him up on an exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these things I'll give you if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, away with you, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only you shall serve. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Divya. Right. Um, it's interesting. So this, uh, the one that I uh, shared on the chat section is from the Amplified version. It's Amplified Classic Edition. Right. Um, it says, again, the devil took him upon a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms, right? King Kingdoms of the world and the glory, the splendor, the magnificence, the preeminence and excellence of them. And he said to them, these things, that means the kingdoms of the world, I will give to you, just bow before me and worship me. I will make you a king, right? All the lies of the devil, all the lies of the world, uh, right? The lust of the flesh, the pride of the eyes, everything is in this context here. Um, but it is only in Jesus that we have legitimate true royalty amen it is in jesus that we have true royalty okay um so that is john, uh, john uh, matthew chapter 4 verse 8 to 10 um the devil knows the power of worship and he will use that against us like in the form of idol worship and just make false promises i will give you all of this i will you will have so and so just worship me Okay, uh, another scripture for us to read is uh, Romans chapter 5, verse 17. Romans chapter 5, verse 17, um, in the chat section, uh, just read it for us. It says, for if because of one man's trespass or lapse, offense, death reigned through that one, much more surely will those who receive God's overflowing grace, unmerited favor, and the free gift of righteousness, putting them into right standing with himself, reign as kings in life through the man, one man, Jesus Christ. Once again, the, you know, the emphasis is through Jesus. Because of what he did, he has made it possible for us to reign with him as kings. Amen. Uh, I, I also like the NLT version. It's... Uh, slightly a little bit more slim, simpler right it's the nlt version of the same verse romans 5 17 it says for the sin of this one man adam caused death to rule over many but even greater is god's wonderful grace and his gift of righteousness for all who receive it will triumph over sin and death through this one man jesus christ amen uh, and finally, just let's read one last scripture. That's Romans chapter 8, verse 17. Romans chapter 8, verse 17. It says, and since we are his children, we are his heirs. In fact, together with Christ, we are the heirs of God's glory. And if we are to share his glory, we must also share his suffering. Okay. Amen. So that's, that's the end of this section. The third point is worship empowers us to rule and reign. Because through Jesus and what Jesus has done for us on the cross and by the shedding of his blood, he has made us a kings and priests unto God the Father. We are now his royal priesthood, a holy nation. Amen. Um, I love this quote by Bill Johnson. Uh, I want you to write it down, okay? It says, um, wait, what is the quote of God? <laughs> um, we rule with the heart of a servant and we serve with the heart of a king. Can I say that again? Okay. We rule with the heart of a servant and serve with the heart of a king. Amen. 
that's what a royal priesthood looks like, isn't it? Um, and this quote has actually stayed with me for a long time now. Um, I've it just motivates and, and, and has encouraged me. And, uh, and that's what worship does. True worship does is it will empower us to rule and reign. But we rule with the heart of a servant and we reign and serve with the heart of a king. Amen. So let that sink in. Okay. Uh, so that's the end of this section. Uh, we will resume from the next section on worshiping God in difficult times and continue from there. Okay. Uh, so we'll take a short break and uh, see you back in 10 minutes. All right. Take it, guys. <laughs> 